views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello everyone, welcome to Open BX RX Remote, brought to you from my living workspace, Chari Executive Suite. I'm Rina Valentin, your host, Cafe Con Leche, every Friday. Here's what's coming up in today's show. Lady Things All will speak to two Latina counselors from the Falcon Network to discuss the Wise Women's Pride podcast, a show creating an open space for women to share their healing stories. After that, we'll be joined by NYC Parks Commissioner of the Bronx, Iris Rodriguez, to discuss this year's Bronx Fit Fest, which will include free health and fitness activities for all to enjoy. Then we'll find out about the different films featured in the second annual Mott Haven Film Festival when we speak to executive director and founder Ninoska Carolina. Later on in the show, Bobby C. brings us an up-to-date with the latest headlines in the world of sports. And lastly, this week's Open Artist Spotlight shines on Latin Grammy Award-winning musical artist Mireya Ramos, who talks about her latest single, Tour Life, and more. So sit back y prepárate. All this and more is headed your way, because now we are officially open. Welcome to Open. I'm Rina Valentin, your host of Cafe Con Leche for the next hour, inviting you to get social with us online. That is, tweet us and follow us on Instagram at BronxNet TV and like us on Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. And of course, while you're there, you can follow moi on Instagram, FB, Twitter, Insta Stories, and LinkedIn at Rina Valentin. So it is Hispanic Heritage Month, and uh, we're going to continue celebrating. And today, we have two Latina counselors from New York City who have created the Wise Women Pride podcast, a show that explores the different seasons women typically encounter in life through the lens of four female archetypes, also known as the Pride Sisters. And joining us to tell us more about the Women's Pride podcast, our co-host, please welcome founder of the Falcon Network, Jeanette. Torruella, and Director of Development, Lourdes Figueroa. Hello and welcome, ladies. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you for being here with us and taking the time because I know uh, counselor's job is never done, right? Here That's the- correct. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start with this wonderful concept of the archetypes because um, I was trying to like really navigate through it and, and, and so... First, of course, just give us, uh, provide us with some insight as to how the Falcon Network uh, was established and um, the expansion that's occurring. And then from there, we'll we'll dive into the archetypes because I find them very fascinating. (laughs) Sure. Um, So I created the Falcon Network, uh, I think in 2016. And in 2016, it was still an idea, but it was definitely a passion of mine to work with... uh, uh, coaching people, specifically women and families, um, I find sometimes as uh, Latinos aren't always open to counseling, but they'll be open to working with a coach, you know, and working to uh, through some goals. And so I found that using my skills as a counselor in, in coaching um, really helped people to open up to the idea of counseling if they needed it or just helping them work through whatever goals they wanted in coaching. So it's, it's a good com- combination. I've seen women who are in therapy and also working with me as, uh, as a coach. So it's, it's, a, it's an enhancement to personal development and it could be a great uh, platform to kind of, you know, uh, uh, a gateway to counseling. <laughs> but no, I get it. I get it. It's like a, a, it's a wonderful. Um, it's a wonderful platform to attain like um, tools to navigate through life because. Yeah. 
especially during these times. I mean, I think we all need it. And, yeah. um, and I do understand that you're both counselors and coaches. So I, uh, l let's have a conversation with Lourdes uh, about her role um, as the director of development for the Falcon Network. Welcome. So, uh, thank you. So I'm working with Jeanette um, really more so this year than ever. Um, Jeanette came with this idea and she told me that this was in the works in 2016, but it was always um, an idea. And when, you know, in, <laughs> during our late hours of working together in our office space and, and decompressing from the day's, tr you know, tragic crises, um, unexpected crisis of every single day, we began to talk about, huh, what if these things occurred? What if, and I always said this to Jeanette, I, I said, you know, somebody should record this conversation <laughs> that we're having. This is uh, something that interests not just our students and our, our school building leaders and, and the school community at large, but this is something that hits home. It, it hits home to the family, to the development of, um, you know, healing, the healing process in a family. Like, what does that look like? Why don't we talk about these things? Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was a lot of just great ideas that happened in our room. And uh, because of Jeanette's great creative energy, we have the Falcon Network. And we That's have awesome. women in the tribe. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, and then there's the, you know, what I didn't say at the top of the introduction is that I know Jeanette from way back from yeah. when she was uh, a New York and Rule, a <laughs> member of this amazing art, you know, improv group that uh, had a lot of political undertones within their, their humor. Um, and, um, and you guys really left an impact on, on our community. So um, it was quite lovely to uh, re-engage with you on, on, unfortunately, on the you know, uh, sad circumstances, our beloved Angelo Lozada, who, who transitioned. But um, after reuniting with you, I've been following you since and, and just really observing and, and admiring the, the, the path that you've chosen. And, and I know that you're, you're in the process of attaining your PhD. Yes. I know. It's so awesome. It's so awesome. It's so awesome. <laughs> But, um, but I love this concept. I mean, yes, we're here to talk about the podcast, but I wanted to set it up a little bit so that uh, our viewers understand that, um, that it's important for us to just be with each other in, in, in our different chapters, right? And, yes. and sometimes people, they kind of fade off into other directions, but, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're the same person, mm -hmm. right? It, it doesn't mean that we're, we're, we're not the same and or that we're that much different, just yeah. like you're saying, enhance. And that's what you're offering uh, as a service. And so um, this concept of, of wise women, pride sisters, the maiden, the warrior, the mother, and the crow, I was like, oh my gosh, what is this? And what, 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 please, please, please do elaborate because I really want to know. <laughs> Oh, we're we're only starting, girl. Like this is gonna <laughs> this is gonna expand. There's so many so many things down the pipe that's coming regarding the Pride Sisters, and I'm really excited about it. I you know I I'm I'm always gonna be an artist, and once an artist, always an artist. So yes, my background I have a theater background, but that also led me into counseling. Um, so I combined the two. The podcast is my moment to kind of like combine my the formal knowledge that i have with with the experience that i have of being a performer and reaching and connecting with others but in in regards to the pride sisters it really came out of uh, a workshop that i was doing a group of women that i was coaching and in in that process like they they got something from it but i got so much more i think from from working with them and uh the pride sisters really was came out of that experience and how we can be in different seasons in our lives and how these seasons are not linear, meaning you're not a crone just when you're old or in <laughs> menopausal stage or whatever. Like I have met, and I know Lourdes can attest to this as well, as a counselor, I have met 16 year old girls who are crones who have so much wisdom because of the life experiences that they've gone through. Um, and I have met women who were in their 80s who were maidens and still look at life from a, from, from a fresh and, and from, from a learning lens. 
um, and just embracing the newness of life. And that's, that's the maiden. So you can be uh, any of these uh, pride sisters at any point in your life. And sometimes these pride sisters are, are helpful. And sometimes if you have too much of them, it, they could be overwhelming and, and you're off balance. Right. So on um, podcast on the podcast with with Lourdes, that's what we talk about. I don't know if you want to add to that, um, Fig. Yes, well, I wanted to add to the fact that the the archetypes almost give us an excuse to talk about them as if we were talking. You know, like you always have people say, "I have a friend who might want to see a therapist because she's going through," and the friend is you, really, right? So the archetype is somebody we can use to understand our behavior, understand our process and where we are and support. It supports us because it, it immediately connects us to community. So I'm not the only person going through this issue. And we may be bringing up, um, I don't know, blended families. We may be bringing up issues like um, how to heal from sexual abuse um, or violence. But or divorce. <laughs> Right, but <laughs> under the umbrella of an archetypal type, right? And that, that's what I love about it. Like for me, it is such a, here's a door. Let's see how many people come in. <laughs> it's, it's lovely. It's lovely. It's clever. And thank you for breaking it down for me. And I wish we had more time, but, you know, unfortunately, this isn't a podcast. <laughs> 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 so our surfing is up. But, but, but I do want to, I do want to just, uh, just share with our viewers, the note that we're ending on is, is, is very, very welcoming, right? Because they created these archetypes, right? That allow, that are being used as metaphors, but they allow you to kind of almost float through them, right? Depending on where you are in life. Yes. And, 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 and again, it's, it's really just, uh, having the ability to find a safe space that is offering you these tools so that you can navigate through life uh, a lot more efficiently and, and most importantly with joy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Balancing, balancing. Balance, I got, I think balance I and joy. <laughs> balance and joy. Vámonos para allá. Yeah, vámonos para allá. That's where I want to be. Bueno, thank you ladies for taking the time. I wish we had more time, but um, that was lovely. And thank congratulations you. on now expanding thank into you. a podcast. Um, your website is awesome. I, I highly recommend that you guys scroll through that website as well because there's blogs in there. And um, and then again, of course, there's the Wise Woman podcast, which is available on Spotify. And um, thank you again, Jeanette Torruella. Torruella, I said it right. And Lores Figueroa. And you guys, for more information on both these ladies and the services they're offering, you can visit the Falcon Network. Com. All right, we have to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll hear about some fitness activities that uh, you can enjoy right here in the Bronx. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. So many people are looking to get back in shape after staying inside for almost two years, if you can believe that. Yeah. So the New York City Parks Department is encouraging Bronxites to get fit and most importantly live a more healthier life by holding the Bronx Fit Fest. The event will include free fitness and dance classes, wellness screenings, and more for all to enjoy. And joining us to tell us more about this year's event, we welcome the only Latina to serve as the New York City Parks Commissioner in the Bronx. Please welcome Iris Rodriguez. Hello and welcome. 
Hello, hello. Encantada. It's a pleasure for me to be able to join you, Rina. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to be able to inform uh, our Bronx sites of this wonderful event that we're going to be having. Uh, this is when we talk about being fit. I mean, I myself personally uh, want to be able to participate. So we're looking forward to inviting all Bronx sites to join us at St. James Park on Saturday, October 2nd. Well, first, I want to just wish you a happy Hispanic Heritage Month, acknowledging you on record, uh, a historical moment of us just recognizing you as the only Latina to serve as the New York City Parks Commissioner in the Bronx. Um, that's not to be overlooked. Uh, you've been doing that for six years now. So congratulations on that. Oh, thank you. Thank you so very much. And it's a pr it's, it, I am so proud to be able to serve at this because I want to be an example for all the other Latinas also and the, the women that know that can aspire to be able to be and sit in the position that I am today. Of these decisions, right? Of the decision-making aspect yes, of it. And then, and then there's the, that relatability, right? And, and there's that, that commonality of, of being able to understand what our needs are, right? Um, you, you, you opened up by saying, you know, even for myself, I think for all of us, I mean, there's a reality of us being um, uh, an environment in which we didn't have the, um, the flexibility as, as people who may live up in the suburbs and in, in, in being able to go out to their backyards and, and, and you know, work out and then our gyms were closed. And, and of course, the, the parks are, thank God we're, we're uh, a city of parks, but um, and, and particularly the Bronx is, is the, the borough with the most parks. But there's that uh, community of understanding that, you know what, that is just as important as keeping safe. Oh. Our health. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, the thing is, when you talk about, we, we here in the Bronx have about 7,000 acres of parkland that are available to the public. And we want to know that, you know, with, with everything that has happened over the last year and a half, people have utilized our parks as their outdoor fitness uh, place to be able to go to. Like you said, uh, Rina, that there is the, the gyms were closed, everything was closed. So people used our parks to do the celebrations and to do their fitness. Uh, so we are just, this is the Parks Department has always provided a uh, healthy out you know, uh, outlets for people to be able to participate in. Uh, so we're so happy to be able to now uh, come back and provide a, just an event that will focus on the fitness uh, aspect of what we do. Right. So in other words, um, what we're sharing with you guys is that, yes, while the parks are there for you to do whatever physical development that, that you'd like to do independently, they're offering a lovely program that it also includes like Zumba and yoga and outdoor spin classes and even chair aerobics, you know, for those of you who are uncomfortable, like really flexing your body and full yoga positions. Um, I, I understand this pickleball, which I'm not too familiar with. Uh, I would love for you to share what pickleball is for me. And then, of course, this family-friendly game. So, but pickleball, what's pickleball? Well, pickleball is sort of, a, it, it, it's interesting, you know, it sort of came out from the, uh, from the West Coast and it's uh, developing a, quite a following. Uh, so we, we convert sometimes some of the uh, tennis courts also, we've converted some of them uh, into pickleball courts. And it's a new phenomenon that's taking over. It's a sm it looks like a tennis court, but it's a small, uh, you know, a shorter net. Uh, and they use what looks like a paddle ball. Uh, rather than a tennis, a tennis racket. So, I, it, 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 and it's light, it's easy to handle. So I think there's going to be much more uh, interest in this going in the future. And we're looking to be able to develop some more pickleball courts uh, in the Bronx. That's cool. Um, so does that also uh, switch the ball as well, right? Because you said you're switching the nets. Is, is the, the ball different? Is, is yes. It, well, is it's the ball a being bunch, used? It's like a wiffle ball so you know a, a wiffle, wiffle ball, ball, a okay. wiffle ball that has holes in it and it's very lightweight so it's much easier to handle so it's it's easier to work with so yes it's a it's a lot of fun and i welcome anyone to come and participate to be able to learn more about it so um i know this event this particular event is taking place on october 2nd at st james park uh and jerome avenue and 192nd street are there going to be other parks offering this particular fest 
Uh, there's not any, uh, this is more of the citywide kind of uh, a one shot deal, but I just want to say that this basically what it does is that it showcases many of the activities that we have going on in our parks. Uh, for example, the Shape Up program. The Shape Up program is free uh, for, for participants and it's located in various parks throughout the city. Uh, and it's a free like aerobics, Zumba, you know, your classes that are that are held. And it's by volunteers, by, by individuals who have taken classes with us and, it's, and they go right back to their community and provide these services, which is amazing. Aside from the fact that we in the Parks Department have a lot of fitness uh fitness equipment right you know we have fitness equipment throughout our parks that people can also avail themselves of so it's important for everyone to know that the parks department is so um so proud and happy to be able to provide all these many uh, amenities in our parks yeah and so the events taking place from 12 to 4 uh based on this particular itinerary and um and you mentioned that there's these uh these activities that you've actually developed people in and that are actually passing it forward and then there's the community on and so um with regards to the um the accommodations right um are are there any restrictions or uh are there any requirements that people need to abide by Oh, yeah. So we ask for people to sign waivers. Okay. And they should sign waivers because you never know, uh, you know, it, it, it's important for people to understand that we want people to be safe and to be healthy in terms of doing some of these activities. Uh, so we want people to, to also come and wear masks, you know, come wearing your mask. Uh, and if you're under the age of 18, you should come with a parent uh, to be able to, to sign, you know, have them sign the waivers and things like that. Uh, what's wonderful is the fact that we're going to be doing some screenings uh, it doesn't take the place of a doctor's recommendation, of course. Uh, this is just to give you an idea as to where you stand uh, in terms of the screening ability, you know, in terms of your health screening. Um, so just know that- So what kind of health screening are we talking about? Uh, so it's basically like like the, 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 the body, um, you know, in terms of your weight, um, the, the, the weight that you have, the- uh, I the BMI, the body, the body BMI. yes, <laughs> BMI. So those, those kind of things. So that, those are the things that we're providing at the event. So it's it's not a physical, but it's like a generalized uh, uh, physical in understanding like where your um, your health levels uh, should be in Absolutely. with regards to right with your BMI right. matching your weight and your height and all of that. Absolutely. And then it will give you suggestions as to some of the things that you can do, uh, you know, beyond the fitness fest. You know, we don't want you just to limit yourself to just the fitness fest. We want you to be able to continue uh, to be able to do activities that are relevant to your health. So what you're saying is that there's going to be experts in all areas of, of wellness, it sounds like. And, and quite frankly speaking, just from my perspective, I feel that it's really, really important for all of us to be proactive in our own wellness, right? In our own health and, and not just be so reliant on, on what the outcome could be versus trying to prevent the outcome from even occurring and it starts with like being in touch with your body absolutely you know every everything it says preventive okay so if you get into a routine uh if you get, believe it or not the mind is is a wonderful place because if you get into a routine you start feeling better about yourself it starts it starts with the mind and then it goes through the body so it's all relative yeah it is it is and thank you so much for taking the time to share this with our viewers Oh, it's, it's my pleasure and my honor. And I look forward to seeing all of our barn sites be able to come and join me uh, on Saturday, October 2nd from 12 to 4. Please come and, and bring a towel. You have to, you should bring a towel. You should bring a, a yoga mat. You should bring water, you know, some, some water for yourself. So just be prepared. Bring, you know, make sure you have sneakers. Make sure you have comfortable clothing. So that's what we look forward to seeing you on, on that Saturday. Wonderful. Thank you. You heard it directly from... Uh, the Bronxboro Commissioner of New York City Parks, Iris Rodriguez. Once again, we're talking about the Bronx Fit Fest that's taking place on Saturday, October 2nd from noon to 4 p.m. at St. James Park located at Jerome Avenue in West 192nd Street. And for more information, you can visit nycgovparks.org. All right, we have to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll hear about the second annual Mont Haven Film Festival. Don't go anywhere.
everyone, welcome back. Our next guest is a Bronxite who decided to give back to her community by creating the Mott Haven Film Festival. The main goal of the event is to elevate the voice of Bronx filmmakers by giving them space to showcase their projects. Now, for the second year, the Mott Haven Film Festival is back with more films, but this time it's got a little twist and we're gonna talk more about that. So joining us to tell us more about this year's film festival, we welcome founder and executive director, Ninoska Carolina. Hello and welcome. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Well, congratulations on your second year. Thank you so much. And um, obviously I uh, made the uh, formal introduction of it being a platform to elevate Bronx voices, but from what yes. I understand, uh, this year, it has it, 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 it's actually expanded it outside of the Bronx, um, not mm -hmm. only for Bronx filmmakers, but uh, just in general, like uh, international, right? Yes, yes. We were very fortunate to become an international film festival in our first year. Um, initially, we wanted to be exclusive to the Bronx, but um, after some feedback, we decided to open up to New York City, New York State, and the rest of the world. And we were just fortunate enough to have three international films. Um, one was um, done in China, one in Nigeria, and one in Mexico. And those were really big hits last year. So we decided to continue doing the same thing for our second season. So, all right. So let's just backtrack a little bit, right? So. Mm -hmm. You opened up, this is your second year, which means your first year was in 2020? Yes, it was. <laughs> that was a very so, interesting year to uh, create to a say the least. Yes. That was exclusive to the Bronx. And um, I, based on the circumstances in us uh, finding community virtually uh, mm -hmm. is, I guess, what led to your expansion in opening it up to a broader audience because that's exactly who your audience was, right? Um, yes. The world. <laughs> so <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> However, I think it's really cool that in its reopening in person, it's back in the Bronx. But yeah, mm -hmm. now you're bringing, now you're bringing the world to the Bronx, we'll say. Right. Well, that was the idea overall. Um, back in the late, uh, late 2019, when I first came up with the idea, I was actually on a plane to LA to a film festival. And it just dawned on me, like, why are we flying to LA for a film festival? People from LA or anywhere really should be coming to the Bronx and go come and attend a film festival in the Bronx. So that's kind of like where that Bronx pride came in. And that, that was part of the initial um, idea overall. Like I wanted people to come visit the Bronx and see that there's so much arts and culture, not just, um, you know, hip hop and, and break dancing, but there's other forms of art out there. So, so what are the criteria that people need to meet in order to qualify for this festival? Well, the overall qualification is to have a beginning, middle and end, right? Um, the film can be anywhere between a minute long to 120 minutes long. Um, that's where the shorts and the feature films come into play, those uh, different categories. But overall, if you have a project and you're very passionate about it and you want to submit it into a film festival, um, we, we are here for you to do so. Okay, and so um, I know the film festival is coming up. So uh, if you're yes. interested in submissions, you're going to have to wait for next year because yes. the <laughs> selection has already been made. Um, yes. However, I wanted to just share with everyone, you know, that there's a, a nice variety. You have short mm -hmm. films, you have feature films. It's, it's actually happening two days, uh, October yes. 9th and October 10th. And, and feel free to share some of the films that are going to be featured and, and how they were chosen. And, um, and, and I guess how you curated the storytelling, right? Because if, if the short films, they're, they're all in, in one block, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm assuming like there's a message in the entire like block. Yes, of course. So we, um, we are showing 24 films this year. Um, two of them are feature films, which means they're over 60 minutes, and 22 of them happen to be short films. And then um, the, there's 22 independent filmmakers um, that were selected. And overall, the uh, message, especially in the uh, Sunday 3 p.m., 
um, is is tailored towards uh, films being done during COVID, right? And either you see someone wearing a mask or the mask is very present there. Um, but overall, that's um, that's the message for that one particular slot. But overall, we have we have a thriller, we have comedy, we have documentaries, we have experimental. Um, we just have a variety of films and you know, you just, you can contact us and ask us like which one we may suggest for you or maybe your family member and we will be more than happy to help you out with that. So um, I understand the film festival is um, being hosted at uh, Create Hub. Uh, can yes. you share with us what Create Hub is so that people understand what they're uh, going to be experiencing and also if, if tickets need to be bought in advance like I'm, I'm assuming you have a, a limited amount of people that you can yes. have per block so let, let's talk about I guess that criteria as well right so the Create Hub is um, a creative studio space um, uh, we have different rooms and we call them studios and basically we are Every, every studio is a different person. Like we have tattoo artists, we have, you know, the offices of the Mahaven Film Festival. Um, and, you know, there, anything that you could think of is probably coming out of that one space. And so there is a gallery there and that's where the uh, Mahaven Film Festival is going to take place. And we will be using also the lounge area. And overall, it's, uh, it's best to buy your tickets beforehand. Um, you can just visit our website or go to the link in um, our bio for the for Instagram and it will take you straight over to Eventbrite and you can just purchase your tickets there. There are some requirements due to COVID um, that we do need to follow this year. Um, but overall, everything is, is set for 50 seats per slot. So once the 50, mark, 50 seat mark is, is done, that's it, no more seats. So 50, 50 seats per block. So, and all together, how many blocks are there? There's a 12 p.m. screening on Saturday, right? Yes. Yes, yeah. there's a 12 p.m. Mm -hmm. And then a 7 p.m. So it's six um, screening slots in total, three per day. Three per day. Wonderful. Yeah. And, uh, and, and how are you feeling uh, having created and, and just been able to navigate through all of these obstacles in, to make sure <laughs> that your film festival is executed even on a higher scale this year? It's been tough, but it's a good tough. Um, it has definitely made me much more resilient and uh, much more patient with how things are, are happening nowadays. So last year we did have a hybrid like an in-person and virtual but at a much smaller scale and we're kind of uh, imitating that this year but um but now the restrictions are different um you know with the vaccination requirement um so we're, we're working around it we're trying to be as flexible as we can but we also need to consider safety first and the safety measurements were different you know from the way they are now so it's 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 been a, a roller coaster indeed. <laughs> well, 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 congratulations to you again on executing this film festival that is so Thank important you. to the Bronx. Uh, once again, everyone, founder and executive director of the Mott Haven Film Festival, Ninoska Carolina. And if you guys are interested in participating, as in mm -hmm. attending the Mott Haven Film Festival, it's taking place on October 9th and October 10th, yeah. and it's a full day uh, with three different blocks. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more of what films are being featured at what time, all you have to do is visit their website at mhff.nyc. All right, <laughs> we do have to take a quick break, but uh, Bobby C's Weekly Sports Roundup is coming up next.
Last Monday, we spoke with critically acclaimed author Dave Zirin. And later in the show, we continue our discussion. But first, we turn our attention to the New York football scene, where the Giants and Jets are a combined 0-6 to start the 2021 NFL season. On an afternoon when the Giants retired Eli Manning's number 10, the G-Men fell short of their first W, falling 17-14 to the Atlanta Falcons. Following the loss, head coach Joe Judge and QB Daniel Jones spoke about how to right the ship. You come out of any game without success, okay, and there's things that you're you know, obviously you know, not happy about, okay. The key for us right now is to make sure that we go back to work, we correct the mistakes, we keep being productive and things are doing well, and we stay together as a team and keep pushing forward. We're all competitors and we want to win, we expect to win, so that's, uh, you know, frustrating and, and we've got to understand that and, and feel that, um, you know, today, but uh, as we move forward, we got to use that to motivate us to look at, uh, you know, what we've done well and what we need to correct and, and you know, how we need to um, attack this week going forward. While the Giants nearly got into the win column, the Jets failed to put a single point on the board as the Denver Broncos steamrolled their way to a 26-0 win. Following the game, rookie signal caller Zach Wilson emphasized that the key to his team's success is patience through an ongoing process. I feel like it's making me stronger. You know, this is, this is hard. I didn't, I didn't experience this in college, and, and the crazy thing is I knew it was going to be like this, you know. When you come into a program that you know, has all new guys coming in. It's a process and, and all of us want to get better and um, give everything we have. And so we just have to understand that we need to take it just one day at a time. And, you know, people can hate all they want, but this is, this is, you know, what, what's feeling sorry for ourselves going to do really. Right. And, and so, you know, we need to keep our confidence high and just understand that we're in this position for a reason um, and understand that, you know, we have the talent and we have the players and, and we have the coaches and the scheme to get, get this thing done. Both New York football teams will look to get their first wins on Sunday. Now we continue our discussion with acclaimed author Dave Zirin, whose latest book explores social justice protests in sports. You've actually chronicled so much of Muhammad Ali's career uh, during your journalism career. When he passes in 2016, I, I feel like at that time there was kind of a unification in the media about his greatness, not only as an athlete, but his role in social justice that, that wasn't there when he was a professional boxer. At the same time, all of this is going on with Kaepernick and, and just how ironic that was. It was unbelievable. I was at Ali's funeral. Um, and, you know, the gap between that there was so much talk there about the memory of Ali and how important it is. And, and then you have Colin Kaepernick putting it into practice and he's, he's immediately buried for it by the same media that was praising Ali. And, you know, it's not that different from what one of the high schoolers said to me um, about, you know, the backlash against her when she took a knee. I mean, she talked about how, you know, that um, adults always say to her that, you know, you shouldn't be apathetic, you shouldn't be apathetic, but then she did something and then she got a lot of grief for it. So it's almost like the one thing worse for a young person than being apathetic is when you actually try to do something. I mean, it's like you cannot win. Yeah, I mean, and that actually leads me to my next question, because in your opinion, I mean, what is the contrast between the response by pro athletes, even between 2016 and 2021, and how it's also been received by everyone else, you know, I mean, in terms of what they were doing, but also the response by people that just, just different in the last five years, Dave. Yeah. I mean, it's changed dramatically. And that's part of the, even though there were athletes being political before Colin Kaepernick, of course, even in this recent era, um, WNBA players were protesting over that summer in 2016 to just take one example. What Kaepernick did, you know, playing for the most high profile sport in the country at the most high profile position in the country and was a Super Bowl quarterback on top of that. I mean, it really sent the discussion in the stratosphere and it really did polarize it. I mean, you had, Kaepernick wasn't an athlete all of a sudden that you either liked or disliked. He was an athlete you were either for or against. And people had to reckon with that, not just on a grassroots level, not just at a barbershop level, but in the pros as well. And you profile his rise to stardom in the NFL. Do you believe now that his story has served as one by the league and maybe even other leagues around the country to ward off similar acts by athletes? Yeah, I think the reason, the number one reason why he doesn't have a job in the NFL, which is a league where everybody talks about, you know, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. 
uh, is because he serves a greater purpose for NFL franchise owners as a cautionary tale, as a ghost story, as someone who can be used to frighten young athletes uh, to, to really stay in line and not buck what is a very authoritarian top-down system in the National Football League. Uh, and you know they're, they've had some success doing that. But on the other side, if you're a 22-year-old NFL player today, think about it, you were 17 when Colin Kaepernick took that knee. And so you've been actually growing up, the ones I spoke to, you know, grew up in those years thinking of him as a hero and someone who sacrificed for the broader community. It's sad to believe that that might actually be the case. You know, and, and we mentioned it moments ago, but I mean, obviously the, the last two years have been trying times for this country. We flash forward to, to 2020 and, and I wanted to focus for a minute on George Floyd. I mean, Derek Chauvin, the officer, of course, that killed Floyd basically shows this kind of horrific inversion of peaceful protest in, in kneeling and killing George Floyd. To some degree, is there a, a tone deaf hypocrisy by police in the police kneeling of solidarity that follows that incident? Oh, it's absurd. I mean, by by doing that, what it does is it not only cheapens the gesture, it appropriates it and tries to turn it into a symbol of unity. When what Colin Kaepernick was calling for was not peace, but he was calling for confrontation of what is an unjust system. Uh, it reminds me um, a little bit about Ali again, because it's not like Ali said, all right, we need to get all the people who are for the Vietnam War and all the people who are against the Vietnam War and hold hands and sing Kumbaya. That's not what he did. He said, no, there's a war, it's wrong, and it needs to be confronted. Yeah, I mean, sports have always been political and, and honestly a, a platform for protest. Why, why, in your opinion, is it so hard for people to understand that? I think it's because sports contains the politics that they want. It's not that people don't want sports and politics to mix. It's that they don't want sports and a certain kind of politics to mix. They want the athletes to be seen as at most two dimensional action figures, but they don't want them to be seen as, as human beings who come from communities that are turning to them to be outspoken, to use the platform, to use the microphone, to say something about poverty in the United States, to say something about racism in the United States. That's what people don't want. And I know you teach at the college level. Do you believe that this younger generation through courses like yours and even all of these readings are actually doing a better job of understanding that and making inroads for change? I think it's very different, certainly. I mean, I've been doing this for quite a few years and it's very different now, like being on this sports and politics beat because that used to be there was no either no space for it on the campus or if I would be brought in the lecture somewhere, it would be under the rubric of kinesiology, uh, which often, and, you know, and they would have to take like one class in sports sociology for a credit, but the majority of their time was spent learning about the human body, about physical therapy. Um, um, and these are noble pursuits. I'm in no way uh, denigrating them, but what they have to do with the history of the struggle against racism in this country and the way sports plays into that or the struggle against sexism or homophobia and the way sports plays into that that's not exactly an easy fit but in recent years i see more departments that deal with sports and sociology or sports and history i see sports courses offered because they're very popular quite frankly um, in these different departments and i think that brings together liberal arts students to see sport as something even if they're not sports fans that they need to be conversant in and i think that is very forward looking and important will history look back favorably at kaepernick maybe the way that we now look at ali or someone like billy jean king well i think for some people definitely people are going to look back favorably. the question is will kaepernick's memory be expropriated and appropriated i should say uh, that's the question. Jamel Hill has a, a joke that in 20 years, the NFL will have an award named the Colin Kaepernick Social Justice Award. Um, so if it's appropriated and everybody claps for him, that's a little different. Uh, we don't want to see Colin Kaepernick's political teeth extracted. And frankly, if there are people who 20 years from now don't like Colin Kaepernick, it's important that they not like him for the right reasons. The Kaepernick effect, taking a knee, changing the world is riveting and inspiring told through first-person stories of how taking a knee triggered an awakening in sports. Pick up a copy from Barnes & Noble, Amazon, or bookshop.org.
Dave, thank you so much for taking some time. Always been a big fan. Great to read everything that you write. Thank you so much, Bobby. is a Latin Grammy award-winning musical artist, violinist, vocalist, composer, producer, and mm -hmm. founder of New York's only all-women mariachi group, Flor de Toloache. Born of Dominican and Mexican descent and raised in Puerto Rico, she embodies all of her musical influences, whether classical, mariachi, salsa, merengue, or hip-hop, to create a unique and refreshing sound. Joining us to discuss her solo project, Mireya, we welcome Mireya Ramos. Hello, Mireya. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for finding the time to be with us desde California. Sí, desde California. Yeah, I understand you're on tour, so thank you for taking some time to sit with us and have a conversation. I am a huge fan of Flor. The Toloache. Oh, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, so I'm I'm a little starstruck right now, even though I opened the stage for you <laughs> with Casita <laughs> Maria. It's just lovely to be in conversation because it's different when we're Absolutely. working on it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh let's talk about um your 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 journey thus far, um, working with Flor de Toloache, actually finding, yeah, right, because you're the founder of Flor de Toloache winning all these Latin Grammys and, and uh, being nominated for all these Grammys and Latin Grammys, regular Grammys, and, and, and now <laughs> becoming uh, rather, I guess, uh, exploring your solo artistry. Yeah, it's been wonderful. It's, it's been a blessing to, to be able to, well, first of all, just create um, a collective of women and create something out of just love and passion of music and then you know also exploring and learning about my culture through that whole experience like doing mariachi which is something that my dad did and i watched him perform it growing up and so it's part of the reason why i fell in love with music and with the mariachi tradition per se and so um to be able to continue to 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 express myself through my culture and and then you know share with others and create this beautiful group, Flor de Toloache. We started in 2008. Um, we started with like the dream of, of recording our own music and, and composing our own music and arranging our own stuff and, and then sharing it with the world. And so we did tons of, of gigs in New York. We played for free. We played in the subway for many years. Um, we did quinceañeras, weddings, all like the traditional mariachi uh, type of performances and, and parties. And so um, that was a wonderful experience. And then uh, once we recorded our first album, I think that really uh, helped us share our music outside of New York. And so we, we got nominated with that album and that opened the doors for us to collaborate with other artists. And um, then we got a tour with Dan Auerbach from the Black Keys and that also obviously opened our doors to another market and another type of audience. And so um, that's when our tour, like our real touring experience started happening. And so it's been a wonderful, really crazy ride, uh, obviously up and down, you know, uh, we're in women's groups so, and we're an indie band as well. So a lot of things come with that and it's a much harder road, but we have loved every part of it. And um, it's been amazing to not just um, obviously share our music and empower other women through our music, but also uh, inspire the next generation, which is beyond our dream. And um, it's every artist's, you know, uh, goal is to just to, to share your music now, but also leave a, a, something behind, right, for the next generation. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. Um, you guys are breaking barriers. I know that you just recently also performed at Lincoln Center. Um, I saw a clip on their uh, Instagram 
account. And then there's also the fact that you are, you know, of Dominican and Mexican and but yet raised in Puerto Rico. And here we are celebrating Hispanic heritage and you embody all of it, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. it's beautiful. It's beautiful because I would imagine that is probably what's influenced the, your style because, I mean, one of the, the things that has stood out for me uh, about you, your music um, is that you can actually uh, take a, a traditional, whatever, indie, uh, alternate rock, we'll say, and, and convert it into this mariachi sound, but it has always been your violin to me that really captivates and pulls us in. Oh, I love that. Yeah, everyone. Uh, some people only know me as a singer. Some people know me as a violinist. So it's really cool to hear that perspective as well. And and yeah, definitely that the fact that I come from a mixed household and um, my parents were both musicians. They're passion, truly passionate about music. And they've always made it a big deal for us to, for my brother and I to grow up being proud of being Afro-Latinos and being Dominican, being Mexican. Um, raised in Puerto Rico and, and embracing all types of music. And, you know, my mother was always say, telling us, you know, music is for everyone. It's, it's, a, it's un compartir, it's to share, it's a community thing. And, and so we've always had that mindset. And I think that we both as an artist, as artists, we express that in our music. And, and you know, also the fact that we're a multicultural band, it's very reflective of New York City and um, it's it's also it's very reflective of our, our arrangements. Everyone puts their own sasoncito in the music, so it's it's part of Flor de Loache's sound as well. It's lovely. And so I know mm -hmm. uh, before we go, you're in uh, California. Are you touring uh, with your solo work, or are you touring as the actual group? We're touring with Flor de Toloache. We're opening for Mon Laferte, which is really exciting. Is another artist that we admire, and so. Um, it's been wonderful to to open for her and, and we're also accompanying her during her set. So we have still we've done a week and uh, we still have about four or five weeks to go. So it's a, a, quite an extensive tour, but really exciting. Well, we're happy that you took the time to sit with us and and congratulations on getting out. Right, because we've all been <laughs> like true, working yeah. virtually for so long that that I must know. be exciting for you to be on planes and visiting and being with individuals and audience, especially because it's it's not the same doing it virtually. It's just not. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's scary. It's a different world out there for sure, but it's definitely it's very special. I think that because of the pandemic, I think that we've we've all. Uh, learn to reappreciate those moments that we're on stage and connecting with people, e even if it's, you know, a little bit, a few feet away. It's just the energy is definitely much, much more magical than virtually. And so, well, um, I know you're going to be giving us a, a taste of something. Um, I know you're going to be doing it uh, as a solo artist, but I understand it's a song from uh, that Flor de Toloache sings. Yeah, it's a ranchera, which is one of my favorite things to sing. Um, and it's a, an original song I wrote for Flor de Toloache's second album, which is the album that we won the Latin Grammy with. And uh, it's one of my favorite songs to sing because, you know, it's a ranchera. Ranchera is therapeutic. It always hits your heart, like straight to the heart. So I love to sing rancheras. Bravo. Yes. So we yeah. can we're closing out this episode, uh, definitely celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month con Ghana, right? Eso. <laughs> eso, eso. All right, you guys, don't go anywhere because uh, when we return, Mireya Ramos is going to perform. Uh, what is the song you're going to perform? Regresa ya. Regresa ya. Ranchera style. <laughs> Welcome back here now to perform an acoustic version of Regresa Ya. We welcome founder of Flor de Toloache, Mireya Ramos. <laughs> No. 
Hispanic Heritage Month. For more on Mireya Ramos music, be sure to follow her on Instagram at Yeya Smiles. That is our show today, mi gente. Thanks to all our guests for coming through and to you, our viewers, for tuning in. If you missed any part of the show, you can check out the Recable Cast tonight in 24 hours a day on BronxNet.tv. And um, from all of us here at Open, may the universe provide peace, prosperity, and love. And bueno, happy Latinx Heritage Month, mi gente. Rina Valentin, signing out.